Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Let's Talk Business South Carolina. We are up to episode number 55, if you are keeping score. And as always, I am your host, Rick Jenkins. It's time for another industry outlook today. I'll be joined by Andy Kurtz. Andy is the founder and CEO at Copus. They are a software development and technology solutions company. Andy and I will be talking about the state of artificial intelligence and machine learning. What industry is more exciting and moving faster than that one? Not one. Andy will be with me in just a minute. But first, I want to thank our presenting partner, Hainsworth Sinclair Boyd, one of the premier law firms in the Carolinas. With more than 100 attorneys, Hainsworth Sinclair Boyd has litigation experience in almost every industry, and IT is no exception. Hainsworth has represented everyone from original equipment manufacturers and video game software producers to website developers and internet businesses. They assist clients with business entity creation, IP asset protection, joint venture agreements, license negotiation, and dispute resolution, and a bunch of other stuff. So thank you to Hainsworth Sinclair Boyd for helping to make it possible for us to bring this content to the business community in South Carolina. All right, let's get to this month's industry outlook. And folks, I'm going to tell you, it is a big one. Uh, we're talking about artificial intelligence and uh, machine learning. And what more fun can we have than that, right? And here to help me talk through that conversation is this guy. This is Andy Kurtz. He is the founder and CEO of Copus. Andy, well, Thank you. Good to be here. It's good to have you here, and it's good to welcome you back yeah, to the show. Yeah, good to be back. So, uh, if I remember right, you founded Copus 26 years ago. Yeah, we're on 20, we're 26 year. yep, 26 years. 26 years ago, my goodness. Now, when you founded them, you were basically kind of like a, uh, a software creation company, yep. right? Custom software development was thank the phrase. You, thank you. And, but over the years, of course, you've done a whole lot more. Give us that quick elevator. Yeah, so speech. we still do custom software development. We mm -hmm. create software where organizations need it and it doesn't exist. Do a lot of modernization of systems. So a lot of companies have those older systems and, and they need them upgraded to more modern technology, cloud-based technologies. Um, we also now, though, we, we didn't want to just write software for companies when they needed solutions. So we are a Microsoft partner, deliver Microsoft ERP solutions for, for the mid-market space, uh, manufacturing, distribution, uh, big big part of what we do. And then there's the AI world. So, uh, you know, we've right. the machine learning side, like you mentioned, we, we've, we've done machine learning for a while, but then now we've got this new generative AI as well. So we help we help companies figure out how to leverage AI uh, to, to become more efficient and effective. Uh, artificial intelligence, transforming our society, right? Yep. We we feel it in our personal lives. Sometimes you may not know how much uh, you feel it in your personal lives, and we most definitely are feeling it in our work lives. Um, but when we think about the future and the possibilities of it, it can get a little blurry because we don't know where it's going to go. Yep. Uh, but big stuff, right? It is big stuff, and, and it's changed. Yeah. Um, you know, we may have even talked about this just a little bit on, a, on maybe a previous discussion, but... Um, We've been using computers to do quote unquote artificial intelligence of some level for a long time. Mm -hmm. You know, some, so sometimes it was really hard coded, just if then, right. Computer making a decision That's that a right. person's not doing. Uh, we certainly got into decision trees and some things like that. And then machine learning came along and, and, and we have uh, a much more sophisticated capability, really the ability to process data beyond what a human right. can do in at least a fast enough time. And now with generative AI, um, to do it and in, in, to do the same yep. thing, more data, but but to be able to produce things for us too. Right. So pretty amazing. It is, and I want to get into generative AI in a second. But first, I got this question for you: If artificial intelligence is a child, hmm. how old is that child? Is he a newborn? Is he a toddler? Is he in the first grade or middle school or what? You know, I'd actually tell you we probably got two kids. <laughs> so, and one's probably uh, entering his teenage years. That would be the machine learning side. That's certainly more sophisticated. We have more right. more experience with that. The generative AI side is is a, a bit of a toddler. Um, but boy, I think it's growing up fast, and it's growing up faster than your typical kid. Right. Well, let's talk about generative uh, AI then. And before we get into it too deep, just ex define it for us. So. Generative AI is, I mean, the, the phrase generative is the key. It yeah. is AI that generates things for us. It can generate words, stories, 
uh, information via via words. It can generate images. It can generate sound. So it is it, the it ability can, for us to go ahead. Uh, I'm sorry. It can only it, generate though what it is populated with to begin with, right? It is able to generate what it has what it has access to. Yeah. Right. So so the way ultimately underneath generative AI, there are. Um, examples that it can pull from. It could be books, could be documents, could be so lots of words yeah. that it's able to consume, images it's able to consume, videos, sound it's able to consume. And depending on the AI, the generative AI it, itself, right? We've all probably seen chat, obviously, is I'm communicating with it. By the way, generative AI typically also has prompt in front of it for the generation. So it's a combination of prompting for information and then having gener something generated out of the AI. Well, I read a story recently and it used a term that I've not heard before and it said that we have passed the what they call the uncanny valley huh. uh, where machines are eerily similar to humans, at least in the responses that you're getting. The best part where I'm seeing it these days is if I Google something. It used to be that if I Googled Andy Kurtz, that uh, your LinkedIn link would pop up. Yep. It still does. You know, your LinkedIn would pop up, uh, you know, a, a Copus link would pop up, yep. right? Or Facebook, maybe, whatever. But now, if you just add, make it into a question, who is Andy Kurtz, yep. Greenville, South Carolina, then the response changes. It comes back as conversational in a very impressive way. It is, yeah. So so all of that's obviously under the hood leveraging generative AI. But in the end, I think you, you still in those types of scenarios get, like you mentioned, you get the links. You can go do the digging yourself and the research yourself. But it has gotten, uncannily is a good word, um, yeah. you know, eerily close to just being, yeah, I understand what you're asking for. And here's a good synopsis of the, of the answer, whether it's about me, whether it's a, a history question, a technology question, right. but the ability for it to, uh, to do that. And what you're seeing is integration of that generative AI into things that we already use every day. Let's talk about another form of AI that I'm not too familiar with, and that is what they call uh, super AI, which, as I understand it, super AI just surpasses human intelligence in some fashion. What's, what is that? That's the theory. And, and to be honest with you, I don't have a lot of experience yeah. hands-on with super AI. But in, in terms of, of studying AI and learning about AI, it is exactly what you're saying, where the, that the AI is surpassing human intelligence and not necessarily that it's coming up with answers humans can't, mm -hmm. but it's coming up with answers humans can't in a reasonable time frame right. or fast enough. Yeah. And in reality, in some cases, it just might be, hey, it would take us a, three of us a couple of lifetimes to figure out this answer, uh, and it's going to do it quickly just because right. the combination of the volume of data and the processing power that it has access to and is yeah. able to leverage. So it gets a little scary. Uh -huh. when you, and scary, amazing, and, uh, and, and scary, scary. 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 <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a little bit of both. Uh, right, right. So... You know, my question then is, how much can a machine learn? To the end of the internet, if you remember that commercial. I got, uh, I got no. to the end, guy, guy browsing, and he got to the end of the internet. <laughs> like, oh, I'm done. So it's like, it, that that's the information that's available to it. How much information do we have? That's ultimately what it can consume. Um, and I mean, theoretically consume. Yeah. Okay, so a study published last year found that artificial intelligence could impact up to 300 million full-time jobs at some point in the future. They didn't put a time frame on it, but that that is kind of what we're looking at. Uh, 300 million. Population of the U.S., pretty good. Pretty that's close, right? That's right. So just imagine, the, I mean, that statistic isn't the, isn't the whole U.S. Well, well, being out of work. The, uh, there are... When I when I read studies like that, so one of the things um, is is a question of impacted. What does impacted mean? Yeah. So so in some cases it might mean mundane elements of the job are gone, and right. and people can focus on on bigger things. In some cases the jobs are gone, but we've gone through um, we've gone through scenarios where uh, where jobs get eliminated, mm -hmm. and the goal is obviously to move up to a higher level. Job, a more right. value-added job. These jobs go away, but these jobs new are jobs out. appear. Listen, I think there's a risk with AI that it can't be one to one. Yeah, that that scenario does occur. That 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 more jobs are disappearing than than ultimately get 
um, get created. You know, as I'm, I'm looking at uh, some of the info that came out of the survey, it did say that healthcare and education workers would be yeah. potentially be the safest. Um, even though there's a lot going on in healthcare right now, which I want to ask you about where artificial intelligence is coming into play. But, but the point of the survey was, was that these are the types of people and the types of professionals and jobs that require compassion, uh, and a level of compassion and interaction that you're not mm -hmm. necessarily, you know, bedside manner, yep. let's put it that yep. way, right? But those were the ones that. Yeah, I think to. there's probably elements of both. Well, there's, listen, there's elements of every job. Yeah. That, are probably going to be done better yeah. by a computer with all the access to all the information and the ability to process it quickly. And I would argue healthcare is probably one of those areas where looking at symptoms and looking yes. at lab results and lab data and taking it all into account and saying, with all the medical history out there, here's what might be going on with somebody. Yeah, it is. It is going to help replace that element of um, of healthcare, but the taking care of the patient, the 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 bedside manner. This is where you get to that mo emotional intelligence that I was talking about. Both of those are um, areas that require some level of emotional intelligence in dealing with somebody, mm -hmm. and understanding that. So when we get to super AI, maybe they're at higher risk, yeah. but I don't think they're at high risk due to generative AI. We're talking about all the good stuff, but now let's turn and talk about some bad stuff because uh, not only do we have wonderful opportunities, but we have, as the word we've used already, scary challenges that come on. As a society, we have to be responsible. You told me before, uh, uh, before when we were on a phone call once that it's going to be really easy, potentially really easy for someone just to blame it on AI, yep. right? Uh, but we have to guard against it. We do, and that's part of what I was trying to say uh, earlier when I when made the statement of right now we need to hold, make sure our teams understand you're accountable. You can't tell me, oh, the AI did it. Yeah. So this is your job. You might have used AI, but you own the result. Yeah. Right? And so I think we'll reach a point where there are certain tasks we do turn over yes. to AI. But until, until that's the point, somebody still owns that. Yeah. But there are a lot of areas where, listen, we're talking about AI making – legal reviews faster, financial reviews faster, medical diagnosis faster. It's also making the ability to hack yeah, faster. Lots of bad actors. Look, uh, I was in a, a, a meeting just recently with some folks on the security, cybersecurity side, and they said one of the big things is phishing attacks, of which you're getting an email, and I'm just trying to fool you into thinking yes. that this is legitimate and you're going to go put information in some whether it's credentials, whether it's credit card, whatever it is, I'm going to try to get you to go respond. Yeah. You know, we all used to be able to spot the really bad English. Yeah. And it's like, you know, I can tell this is that that's, right. you, that's gone. Yeah. There's going to be something else that people continue to take advantage of more than they have in the past, and that's deep fakes. Oh, yeah. And it's only a matter of time, Andy, before um, a, um, a video comes out of pick your favorite politician or your least favorite politician, and you see that person saying something, uh, and you can't tell if yep. he or she said it or did not. We're kind of already there. That, that uh, is, it, that I've is, seen a few of them, yeah. and if you watch close, you can yeah. maybe pick up on some stuff, but there's going to be a time, if we're not there, that yeah. you won't be able to tell. Yeah, yeah. yeah again, I think you're People are so gullible. They're going to, a large percentage of people are going to buy it. Well, and what I would say is, is, is probably if it's a politician you don't like and they're saying something that proves you right, you're going to be a little less careful about investigating it. That's just, right. That, that confirmation bias is going to really kick in. And so I think, I mean, that's already happening, but, but it's going to get worse and worse. And, and the ability for, for that, that same deep fake though could be right now, my employees could get an email from me asking me to do something as the CEO. Yeah. They could get a phone call mm -hmm. from me, oh, and it could truly sound like me. Interesting. Right? And so the ability, those types, it's going to get, how we, how we guard against that is an interesting question. Uh, you had told me a while back that um, at, in a prior interview that you were surprised that there hasn't been as many um, uh study cases that have been available to read and learn about this. And, and I think you attributed some of it to analysis paralysis, right? Still going on. Still going on. Yep. Yep. So and as a matter of fact, I gave um, a keynote address about this recently at a conference about the fact that we really thought in 2024 
the number of generative AI solutions that we put in place for clients would yeah. be a, a real hockey stick. The hockey stick was the discussions around what's possible with generative AI. Yes. And um, the analysis paralysis from what we've looked at and analyzed is coming from two different things. Part of it is the question of, are we ready for AI? Do we have the policies and procedures? Do we have the governance in place to properly control this and introduce this? Um, and uh, the second one, though, is is figuring out what use cases yeah. to, to, to select and do. And so I think the big caveat to all that is I'm not talking about using chat to get answers. I'm not talking about using chat copilot from Microsoft to, to, to help you with things. I'm talking about truly automating certain elements. Um, we found we had more discussions, a lot of discussions last year, a lot of, ana of analysis of possible use cases, but and, and even prototypes and, and labs, but implementations of, hey, these are now live and in production, that was not as, as um, that didn't fly quite as, as yeah. much as we thought it would. Right. Let's talk about the future just for a second. Um, what's coming down the pike? It, you know, there, there's no way to know, of course. However, I've heard you talk once or twice before about AI companions. What is that going to look like? Yeah, so the idea of AI companions is that there's a personalized agent, for lack of a better term, companion for each worker yeah. that is, is geared to help you do your job and your role better. Somebody who can be looking at your inbox and maybe giving you recommendations, maybe doing some of answering, maybe answering some of them for you. Now, once again, that gets into the danger zone of when are we comfortable it's doing the right answers as opposed to yes. recommend, making recommendations. Depending on your job, you know, it could be uh, analyzing some financial data for you on, our, on just a regular, hey, here's that report yeah. that you have to have and, and submit every week. Right. Um, I prepared it for you for you to look at, review, confirm and send. Yeah. And, and so the ability for there to be personalized AI agents for people in their roles, that exists today. And yeah. the one thing I will say with, with we, we do a lot with Microsoft technology. They are, and, and, and other companies like, like Microsoft, they are making the ability to produce those types of solutions easier and easier and easier. I'm going to get you out of here on this, Andy. Uh, you said something on a, on a phone call we had uh, not too long ago that I absolutely loved. You said, AI is a giant elephant to eat, and it lends itself well to tiny bites. Yep. What I meant by that goes a little bit back to the analysis paralysis. That has That is part of what's caused the analysis paralysis of their, people are staring at this AI. Yeah. I know I got to do it. I know I got to somehow eat this thing and get this. I got to get this integrated into our business some way, but I don't know where to start. Right. And so the reason I we, we believe, and, and I said that it lends itself really well to small bites is you can choose some use cases mm -hmm. and run tests mm -hmm. and get data. So you do not have to do this huge project mm -hmm. to see if it's successful. It lends itself really well to test, throw away. Mm -hmm. The test said, don't do that. These, these are the 10 things we think we might be able to do with AI that would be valuable. Run your tests, pick the ones that prove, hey, we think there's a high probability that, that these can be valuable and just pick one and then, right. so. Andy, good stuff, man. Yep, enjoy Appreciate it as you. always. Yep. Folks, that is Andy Kurtz. He is the founder and CEO at Copus, and he is my AI go-to guy. Wonderful, fantastic conversation. Appreciate you joining us. We'll see you next time.